In her new book, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, a history of contemporary Christian music, scholar Leah Payne argues that anyone wishing to understand some of the most ep epochal, epochal, epochal shifts. Where's the emphasis in that word? Caitlin, help me out. I think epical? it's epochal. Epochal? Yeah, I think so. Okay. At least I didn't say epochal. Shifts in American <laughs> culture and politics over the last 30 years. If you're trying to understand these shifts in American culture and politics, you ought to listen to contemporary Christian music on the radio. Um, the genre of a generation of white evangelicals. Teenage kids like Russell, says Russell, were actually not the market for the CCM industry in the 80s and 90s. It was their moms. Their moms were the market who wanted to protect them from the evils of culture. Uh, the second avenue was the vibrant youth group culture at the time. Oh, is that right? One key way um, that the industry had to solve the problem. <laughs> oh, she, she names a problem because I do remember this. They would train Christian bookstore salespeople who manage the music departments to have a little cheat sheet for moms mm -hmm. to say, if your kids like, for example, the Beastie Boys, recommend Audio Adrenaline. If they like, you know, Metallica, recommend Striper, you know, trying to find the, the relationship. Um, uh, but but Russell says, in, or, or the author says, Leah Payne says, in some cases, it would work the other way. Like one CCM <laughs> listener said, uh, the chart said I would like audio adrenaline if I liked the Beastie Boys. That's how I fell in love with the Beastie Boys. So people also <laughs> swam upwards and say, my mom wants me to listen to this, but I'm going to listen to that. So how did the industry solve that problem? I'm not sure I agree that that was such a widespread problem that the industry had to strategize how to solve it. <laughs> uh, but she argues that one key way was to convince the Christian kids that they they were the edgy ones, the non-conforming Jesus freaks, willing to pray in public and to abstain from sex until marriage. So, yes, is that true? Remember the Jesus freaks book they made about mm -hmm. martyrs? Like, mm -hmm. these, this is everyone who's died for their faith. That's us kids. That's us high school youth group kids. We may have to die for our faith because that's the way the world is going. And I do remember like in the 90s, there was this concerted effort to it, the beginning of the persecution complex stuff like mm -hmm. you as an outsider are going to be maligned and hated and da, 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 da. that was I began picking up on that in high school in the early 90s. Yeah, yeah, me too. So, but I it, I picked up on it way before then. Payne is certainly correct that an entire genre of songs went beyond this to suggest that the kid who feels made fun of for attending a See You at the Pole prayer event is being persecuted by a hostile culture in almost the same way as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Okay, see, now I go back to... Uh, the late 70s and the first couple of years of the 80s. I thought you were going to say the Babylonian Empire. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Keith Green was one of uh -huh. my biggest influences, you know, yeah. kind of because I was just coming through middle school and heading towards high school. I went to high school in 1980, um, started high school. And Keith Green had kind of blown up big. He was a, a you know, a wild piano player prophetic voice started out as a hippie in in the jesus movement which most of the early rockers are christian rockers larry norman randy stonehill keith green all started out in the the hippie uh jesus people movement not the jesus people movement but the yeah the jesus people movement not japuza which is the commune in chicago jesus people usa that's a different thing which mm -hmm. also birthed a great christian band resurrection band which was one of the first really mm -hmm. like seriously hard rock christian bands that's beside the point. Keith Green um, let homeless people live in his home, moved to Texas to kind of start a commune, uh, started, decided after his, I think, second album went big, that he would never, that God didn't want him to charge anyone for his music. So he would mm, give away yeah. all his albums for free, which made his record label a little bit angry. Um, and so he had to make his own record label because like, we're not going to help you if we can't charge money. So the way you got a Keith Green album starting at that point was you would send them a note with whatever you wanted to put in it. One buck, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you wanted to put in it, and they would send you the album. Um, he started the Last Days newsletter and, and we subscribed to the Last Days newsletter, which was kind of radical. You know, we're, we're near the end. Um, we're, we're going to be more and more countercultural. We're going to be up for more and more. 
uh, mockery. You know, he wrote a song about his young son and, and knowing that his young son would probably get kicked and beaten for his faith one day. Um, but that was OK. And his third album, fourth album, his biggest album, because he died in a plane crash shortly after this album came out, uh, was So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. The cover of So You Want to Go Back to Egypt was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing in the middle of a mm. sea of people that are bowing. And, and, it's, and I remember the thing that struck me was that like one of their friends is right next to them in this painting, reaching up and, gr and grabbing at them to get down like his friend is terrified for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I, I could feel in high school like, yeah, that's us. You know, that is us. We, and our friends are saying, don't do that. Don't take that stand. Don't stand out. Mm. And I was like, no, no, I'm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is exactly what she says. So there you go. She's right. We okay. were taught that we were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and <laughs> so, we were going to get thrown in the furnace of cultural disdain. Scott. If I'm, if I'm understanding her argument, and I'm assuming that Russell Moore is accurately translating her argument because I haven't read the book, it goes something like this. There's a lot of Christian parents out there that desperately are worried about their children engaging with secular media and secular music and culture, and they want to give them a safe alternative. So there's a yes. very high value on safety, safety, safety. The problem is safety is not cool. No. It's so not. somehow we have to make these safe alternatives cool for Christian kids so that they won't just do it because their parents are telling them to do it, but they'll do it because they want to do it. Yes. So the solution is if you combine safety with persecution, now it becomes cool. So you're doing the safe thing and the Christian thing and the good thing, yep. but because it's ha it has this perception of you're going to be ridiculed and perhaps persecuted for it, now mm -hmm. that safe thing that your parents want you to do becomes cool because mm -hmm. it includes this possibility of persecution. Is that the formula? Safe plus possible persecution equals cool? Uh, no. Safe does not equal cool at all, even if you put possible persecution in it. What, what is cool <laughs> is standing apart from the crowd. The crowd okay. is going that way. I'm going this way. That's so, cool. And that's like that's like the spirit of rock and roll in the very beginning. So then rock and roll became, you know, when when international banks are using uh, Rolling Stone songs to sell checking accounts, you say, this is not very countercultural anymore. Do you know what <laughs> is countercultural? Me not going along with that, yeah, turning around, it, going the other way and listening to uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman instead. Contemporary American youth culture really emerged in the 1950s, you know, Rebel Without a Cause and all of that yep. stuff. So so what you're saying is the Christian contemporary music world came along and said, basically, we're going to be the rebels against the rebels. Yes. Which makes us more rebel well, and cooler. The, um, the prior generation's rebellion is now the mainstream. It's, it's now, mm -hmm. you know, the baby mm -hmm. boomers, the, the, the drop out, light up, tune out, whatever the, you know. They're now the man, and we're sticking it to the man by not doing that commercialism, mm -hmm. drugs, sex, rock and roll thing. We're doing Jesus, rock and roll, no sex. Jesus, no sex, rock and roll. That's our motto. That's our mantra. Okay. Um, Russell says, the, the nuanced truth that you will be made to feel strange at times for following Christ, but you're not under persecution. And by the way, you're not nearly strange enough in the way Jesus actually calls you to be. Mm -hmm. That message isn't nearly as exciting as this is the terminal generation. The elites are out to destroy you and you are the only thing standing between Christian America and the new world order. That is more exciting. Hmm. You have to admit. Did you, did you get any of that growing up? <laughs> Caitlin? Me? Caitlin? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Sky didn't. <laughs> Sky, Sky didn't. didn't. Uh, he was, he, he was no, doing definitely. puppets with Amanda. I, <laughs> well, and I, this, this has different iterations. It's, and it, it goes outside of just the, the music part of this. Like while you were talking, I kept thinking about how popular the David Platt book Radical was when I was in college. Yes. Um, yes. And there was a similar kind of vibe of like, oh, Christianity is not just, oh, the thing my parents did and it's kind of safe and normal and um, respectable. No, it's actually really radical. But it's that's a lot. The radical version of Christianity that you were talking about and that even I think David Platt's talking about and that Christians throughout 
the centuries and around the world have talked about, which is like sacrificing for other people, living in some kind of voluntary poverty, like those kinds of mm-hmm. things. That's a much bigger ask. You can't really mass market that, but you can mass market you're under attack and they're going to get you. And it's actually really cool to like buck the man and like doing that in a really mm-hmm. abstract way where the focus is on the external, like there's a big bad out there that doesn't like you. That's a lot more mass marketable than the internal thing of, oh, actually the radical Christian message is like sacrificing for the vulnerable and giving your money away. (laughs) And like that, when I was in college, was exciting to a lot of people who had in maybe middle school or high school heard some of the kind of music part of that and had thought that that wasn't actually very substantial. But the idea that maybe there's an older Christian ideal that is radical in the sense of what it demands of you, not the like identity marker that you put on. I've seen that be attractive to people. It's just Mm -hmm. you can't. Yeah, you can't mass market that the same way you can the kind of identity signifier of I'm one of those people that's not like everyone else. (laughs) 